All right, thanks everybody. Uh, we're gonna try to kick off what is, um, we can call it round two of our uh, two-day event, uh, which is basically for uh, people that are watching from the stream. Today is uh, also graduate school open day. And for many of you that may not know the program, uh, this is called the Design Research Lab, and it's basically the post-professional program in architecture and urbanism. Uh, my name is Theodore Sparopoulos. I'm the director, and with my colleagues and students, uh, we basically put on a two-day event, which is the thesis reviews, which are conversational events that we sort of put forward to sort of work through a design research agenda uh, that we've titled Constructing Agency. Research for us is really a kind of exploration of trying to use design as a way of thinking, conceptualizing, trying to see how architecture can participate really in an expanded field of not only thinking about architecture, working on it, but sort of delivering that and making that accessible. Part of making that accessible, I think, is having a very open and honest dialogue about how architecture and design and critical practice and discourse is really very much a part of having a conversation. So this event today is basically an open invitation to the AA community, to students, and uh, to the larger community internationally to at least be able to participate in a conversation. What we speak about in terms of research is things that we sort of problematize over three or four years in terms of an overview, a kind of speculative question. What we've been talking about now is a kind of 20-year-old kind of experiment in its own right within this school, which was really started, I think, in terms of looking at ideas of digital technologies, looking at modes of production, trying to understand, I think, how these things are impacting in a very contemporary way. That project has evolved. It's evolved through many different kind of research agendas. It's gone from one scale of master planning and urbanism down to the scale of material and printing. And with this agenda, in year 20, what we're trying to do is sort of open up that conversation to also try to look at a lot of the contemporary issues that are going on. We titled it Constructing Agency because we believe that things themselves have their own agency and we want architecture really to engage in stuff. The things that we're speaking about are things like living, working, and this concept of culture. And try to understand what we've called, the, you'll, you'll see in a lot of the projects today, speak about the future of culture, the future of living. Future in this context is almost a McLuhan sense. If you're interested in the future, you look to the present, because usually we sort of reference only the past. With that, I think a lot of the questions that we ask are very speculative, and the students today are going to be basically talking about some of those issues and some of those challenges. We begin with certain assumptions, which is based on our history. We look at sort of an evolving experimental idea of practice, and we start to try to work on these projects, both in terms of production and problematizing that, but also to consider more real-time, scenario-driven kinds of ideas of architecture. So for example, Sajid Bouchan, for those who had seen the, the works with Alicia, were really looking at the idea of living, programmatically driven in terms of ideas of housing, but also looking at models of co-living and actually what are different kinds of issues to deal with kind of urban problems of basically being, uh, working in that kind of arena of sort of delivering high quality production but also reconceptualizing the idea of what contemporary living is in the city. Patrick and uh, Pierre Andrea have been working on concepts of parametric semiology. Within the domain, within what we would consider work, startup culture, trying to understand basically how do we really think about actually developing kind of models of innovation and to sort of expand that beyond, let's say, just the nature of what an office is and sort of try to problematize that by actually looking at models of communication and interaction and how we facilitate that in a kind of much more prototypical, scenario-driven way. Uh, myself, Theo, and Mustafa, uh, working also with Apple, have been looking at the issue of culture. We basically took the cue of basically looking at the original competition and competition uh, and entries for the Centre Pompidou, and also looking at a lot of the issues that had to deal with uh, 
uh, concepts of really rethinking what a cultural institution is today by actually looking at some of those kind of problems then. We continue kind of the ideas of trying to look for an architecture that takes its own agency, that is thought about as an infrastructure that deals with ideas of automation, self-organization, machine learning, and intelligence. So within, I think, the context of robotics and fabrication and technology, it's not foregrounded for the sake of technology. It's basically trying to be synthesized in a way to sort of exploit some of the contemporary tools to help us deal with the complexities that we basically deal with when we think about what the nature of practice is today. As part of our conversation, I think we've always had a very uh, generous and active dialogue with our community. That community, I think, can be only really understood as much in terms of the presence of the people that come here and donate their time to really be part of the conversation. And I think the critics that we've had from yesterday and today, I think, is a good sign that that conversation is not only needed, but the nature of the debate and conversation and dialogue is by necessity, I think, very open. We have a lot of critics. Um, I'm going to literally just read these things off, if you don't mind, because we have a lot of critics and realistically speaking, people are gonna be coming in and out all day today and for the people that are watching on the stream and for the students that may not be here, um, I think it's important. So we've had over the last days and continue today, uh, we'll have Ariane Koek, who I basically mentioned, introduced most of them yesterday, but I'll do it again for, for the prospective students who was the initiator, founder, and designer of arts at CERN, uh, was a cultural consultant, and is really uh, specializing in transdisciplinary work. And she's been, I think, a very important uh, figure negotiating between art and science and these kind of cultural practices. We've had Mario Carpo, who's a Raymond Bannum Professor of Architectural History and Theory at the Bartlett. Kate Davies, uh, one of our own here at the AA, uh, who runs media studies and was co-founder of the nomadic design studio Unknown Fields with Liam Young. We have Rainer de Graaf, who's a partner of OMA, uh, theorist, urbanist, and writer. Uh, Yan Gao, who is an architect and principal architect and co-founder of Idea Design. We have our very own Mark Cousins, theorist and director of history, theory, and studies. Uh, we have Tom Kovac, who is Director of Advanced Architectural Stream within the RMIT School of Architecture and is leading the Alessi Visiting School that has an event tomorrow with Patrick uh, at 2 o'clock for those that are interested. We have uh, Philippe Morel, uh, architect, theorist, and co-founder of EZCT Architecture and Design Research, associate professor who's coming to us from ENSA Paris Malakai. Uh, who directs the digital knowledge program there, and he also has been running a 3D printing company. Uh, we have Robert Neumeyer, who is currently a lecturer uh, at the Institute of Design from the University of Innsbruck, a research fellow and PhD candidate from uh, Vienna, and uh, he's coordinating the research group on agent-based semiology, uh, which Patrick is also involved in. Uh, we have Samantha Hardingham is going to be joining us. She's the interim A director. We have Davide Quayola, who is a generative artist, uh, sculptor, uh, working a lot with time-based media. And we're going to have other people that are coming in. And I see Julia here as well, Frazier, who is also one of our own uh, seminal person in this place to speak about computation. And as the day goes on, if there are new critics that are coming in, I'll, I'll do my best to sort of introduce them in some sense. Um, but with that, I thank everybody for joining us today. The schedule for today, we're going to have two presentations. We're going to roughly 20 minutes in terms of the students presenting, conversation for maybe 25 minutes. We do a changeover. We're going to break for lunch. We have three projects that we're going to see in the afternoon. And then I give a concluding talk at 6.30 for those that are interested. Uh, I'm also told that uh, we also have people from Alessi that will be sitting in on the jury. So with that, I'm going to give it over to one of the first uh, teams. It's coming from the Named Bouchan studio. So thank you very much. Um, hello, uh, 
good morning. Uh, we're from Namad Bhushan Studio. My name is Ariadna Lopez, and these are my teammates, Basant El Shimi and Leo Biling. And our research is addressing the future of housing, and the name of our proposal is Cloud Living. Um, own nothing, access everything. That is the aim of Cloud Living. Um, an increase in demand for subscription services such as Netflix, Adobe Creative Cloud, and Drive Now raised the questions of an architectural manifestation of a subscription living model, where there are no tenants, but rather subscribers. Cloud Living explores the benefits of subscription, including scalability and exchangeability of home functions, which are transformed by data collection and peer-to-peer -peer space exchange. The proposal is subscription living as a model of collaborative consumption, where the cost of living is not borne by an individual, but rather within a larger group. The aim is to build a dynamic community in inner city London, which is fostered by technologies which enable data-driven design and combinatorial spatial customization. Thus, the research addresses two threats of investigation as a method to give answers to a subscription living model. We investigate contemporary models of living, such as Airbnb and the collective in London, as well as examples of a combinatorial logic, such as transposed by Airbus. Data shows that 40.9% of the listings on Airbnb for inner London are properties managed by multi-listers. A multi-lister is a person that in average operates 15 properties. Data shows that the multi-listers in London, which are the red dots shows on the screen, manages 607 listings. Thus, Airbnb is now enabling residential properties to be transformed into businesses, serving the commercial sector rather than encouraging a peer-to-peer -peer economy as it was originally intended. On the other hand, the collective has the world's largest living, co-living community with more than 500 users. And although it offers convenient accommodations, including even luxurious amenities, the architecture is unresponsive to a co-living environment by closely following a topology of a hotel. Furthermore, we investigate Bluetooth low energy beacons, which is an emerging technology which merges the physical and the digital world by triggering an action on the user's smartphone when approaching a beacon. This action provides the user with real-time information of their surroundings. The research proposes data as a tool to make informed decisions regarding spatial combinatorial customization of spaces. Following Transposed by Airbus introduces customizable air cabin modules which are tailored to specific flight routes and, custom and customer profiles. This will serve as a framework to further develop our organizational strategies. The proposal is then comprised of robotically woven, reinforced fiberglass components and a lightweight timber structure, which assembled from developable surfaces. This method of digital fabrication is used to fulfill the goals of data-driven design and combinatorial customization within the functions of living in high-density cities. Cloud Living challenges current concepts of home ownership by means of subscription living, where the subscriber owns nothing, yet has access to everything. The research is divided in a six-step process. Beginning with the primitive selection, will provide a foundation for cataloging spatial requirements and develop a combinatorial organization strategy. The primitive selection is anchored by seminal projects, for instance, the Frankfurt Kitchen, which carefully maps logical workflow sequences within the kitchen. This project presents an opportunity for cloud living to redesign spaces according to space usage patterns. Similarly, architects data by Neufert and the study of proxemics by Edward Hall will provide a foundation for the research to develop its own dimensional metrics. The research identifies four distinct primitives, triangular, cubic, pentagonal, and hexagonal prism. All prisms have a height of three meters and a footprint of nine square meters, which is our smallest sleeping unit. Each prism is then translated into our um, geometrical structural timber components. Um, it is also uh, placed with a woven hyperbolic paraboloid 
and it's tested in terms of, the, of its ability to host a variety of living functions. The previous criteria is catalogued for each primitive. Each color corresponds to a gradient of sharing, where cyan is private, blue is semi-private, and magenta is shared. The red primitives show primitives which are unable to fit desired living functions. With this cataloging, the research determines that the cube and the pentagonal prism are better suited for combinatorial spatial customizations. Further, the cubic prism and the pentagonal prism are evaluated based on a cell-to-cell -cell connectivity. Um, and we determined that the pentagonal prism is the most suited for combinatorial purposes. The research focuses on combinatorial description model as a model of spatial organization. The framework for this include the Great Britain Social Survey of 2011, uh, which BBC tries to identify a multi-dimensional measure within a social model. We also look at projects by MIT Media Lab, Pattern Recognition and, Al and Analysis, which uses real-time human activities collected from sensors to analyze space use in a residential scenario. And finally, a data analysis study of a multi-agent occupancy by Autodesk, which focuses on creating a digital simulation of occupants through the use of sequential data analysis. Within this in mind, Cloud Living implements seven description categories, ranging on lifestyle requirements. Each category is inferred by measuring three types of capital, economical, social, and cultural capital. Each subscription is manifested architecturally by translating the original pentagonal prism into customized three-dimensional weaving in the form of hyperbolic paraboloids. The woven doubly curved surfaces range in terms of size, portability, and geometric complexity depending on the subscription category. These spatial conditions, coupled with the timber structure, provide an architectural language which serves the purpose of a combinatorial customization within every subscription. In this manner, Cloud Living proposes a range of residential units which range in terms of size, privacy, and geometrical complexity. However, these spaces are not static. The combinatorial logic embedded in the primitive and the architectural manifestation of the subscription categories prompts spatial transformation in two ways. Space transformed by data collection and peer-to-peer -peer exchange. The research infers a detailed profile for each subscription category. This information will give insight on a timetable of whether spaces are used or unused. Additionally, by making use of a BLE te beacon technology, we can collect data on space usage. This video shows a phone which is receiving a signal of multiple beacons in a room, and thus calculating the signal strength of each beacon, we can precisely locate a person in a room or its usage. In this manner, the research explores real-time data occupancy, which gives the opportunity for spaces to be organized and modified according to their use. Space transformation by data collection provides cloud living with the opportunity to create a living environment which is in a state of continuous change, further adjusting and customizing spaces to the needs of the user and the community. The proposal seeks to implement real-time data collection as a tool to transform spaces which better suit the community, and this animation shows the transformation of a subscription space being further subdivided into living units and lastly into a communal kitchen. The second strategy to transform space is the peer-to-peer -peer exchange, and the animation shows a temporary exchange of subscription inhabitancy in which a living room, which is not regularly used, can be exchanged with a neighboring subscription. If chosen, it can be shared permanently or temporarily. In this manner, the research seeks to build a community which is built on mutually beneficial relationships, in which different categories of subscription can begin to uh, develop a close relationship with each other. The research seeks to identify the site criteria which is suitable for subscription living in inner London. Thus, we target underutilized plots dispersed in East Central London, requiring face construction to exploit the potential of infill sites 
while retaining connectivity to the city. Within this criteria, we locate a total of five sites within a one kilometer radius. And one prototypical site is selected to develop our subscription living proposal. The difficulties presented are narrow street access and small plot areas, which drive motivations of digital design of lightweight timber structures and customizable reinforced fiberglass weaving. The fourth step of our research process is the, is the method of constructing a planning envelope to host the combinatorial subscription spaces. The method will be explained on one of our prototypical sites. The first step is to define a boundary box, which is defined by the plot dimensions and twice the average height of surrounding buildings. The initial primitive is placed at the center of the street facing edge. <clears throat> the following primitives are added face to face within the site boundary. The ground floor has always public amenities which serve the whole neighborhood. The vertical circulation only, at uh, the vertical circulation, um, only um, primitives with a two edge connections are considered. By doing so, the canvas frees up for combinatorial living functions. Potential primitives facing the main street drop out of the selection. The first social primitive is always attached to the vertical circulation. Social primitives are placed according to a given ratio per floor. Not street facing peripheral primitives are assigned for private primitives, shown here in dark blue. And each social primitive gets connected by circulation, shown here in dark magenta. Um, this shows iterations of social spaces and circulations, which are all valid because they serve the changing combinatorial functions. The selected is a moment of the possible, possible iterations. This method is applied further. Each floor has a defined ratio of private, private to social primitives, meaning that the private part is increasing as it goes further up. The next, uh, next is creating the developable surface network. Each primitive serves as an input for that. A face-to-face -face polyhedra packing is created to encase the primitive. The normals of, oh, the normals of each polyhedra face creates a line network. The polyhedra faces also define the profiles to extrude those lines, resulting in this low poly node. Um, oh, the video is not playing. Hmm. One moment, please. So um, a face-to-face -face polyhedra packing is created to encase the primitive and uh, the normals of each polyhedra face create the line network and um, the polyhedra faces are also then, as I said, um, used to create profiles to extrude those uh, lines. Um, out of the low poly profiles, developable strips are created, which are then uh, extended and later trimmed by each other. So um, a kind of watertight node is created. Each of, um, for each polyhedron, this process is applied, resulting in a complete uh, developable surface network, which um, is then later also used to connect um, the hypers. This would be then the outcome of the planning envelope. The slabs um, are resting on the hypers, which are then transferring the loads back to the structure. 
The planning envelope is used as a structural framework for the spatial combinatorial logic to take place. The um, shown steps um, before are then applied to the four further sites, which generate different outcomes of the same system. The fifth step of um, our research process is um, the digital fabrication of the planning envelope. For that, we are looking at seminal projects like the EAMS chairs for strategies of wood bending, the DRL project titled Discrete Network Assembly for strategies of constructing a compression-only network, and the ICD pavilions for three-dimensional weaving with using, using reinforced fibers. <clears throat> Cloud living is composed of robotically woven reinforced fiber glass components and a lightweight timber structure assembled from developable surfaces. We have different individual components which together make our architectural language, including hollow timber nodes, tension cables, window weaving, and hyperbolic paraboloid weaving. All nodes are aggregations of developable surfaces, which can uh, variate in angle and dimension. This shows the evolution of strips and their fingers for intersecting with neighboring strips. Uh, strips. The same fingers are then also uh, used for the weaving later. All nodes are cut out of planar sheets and then are assembled with a adjustable loop knot um, while bending them. The same um, loop knot is also used to um, tie all these different strips together. After this, the, um, the next the timber weaving is applied. The thread is soaked in resin and uh, it stiffs out in like after 24 hours. After the resin is stiffed out, the previous applied um, loops knots can be removed. Also, the hyperbolic paraboloid weaving um, is done by a robotic arm. This gives um, restrictions of a point-to-point -point linear weaving, which we take advantage of by weaving doubly ruled surfaces. With the same method, we can also create planar surfaces, like a floor, floor slab. The window weaving is also connected to the fingers of the node, and um, added to this weaving would be uh, a second layer of glazing. So summarizing, um, out of a planar sheet, we are creating customized curved node parts with any given angle, and out of linear woven threads, we are generating complex doubly curved surfaces. The last step of our research process is occupying the planning envelope. Um, for this particular site, we are locating 35 households. Um, this is an iteration, a moment of this combinatorial living model. The distribution of subscription categories is based on a combinatorial logic, which means subscription with more space give opportunity for exchange to happen. This increases the spatial flexibility. Shown is one iteration of combinatorial arrangements. This will change over time through user exchange and data analysis. This visualization shows all architectural components in full occupancy and further details of the facades are shown here and interior social spaces. Here, um, the interior of a private unit is shown um, where um, the architectural language can be seen, for example, at the ceiling, where the ceiling meets the hypers and creates um, spatial quality. This longitudinal section reveals the variety of spatial qualities within the subscription model. And this is the current state of our research. Thank you. And Ariadna will guide you through the models, if we could get a mic for her. Um, so starting from this side, we start with the first nodes that we build in order to um, understand the developable surface network. So the first node we ever built was hollow, um, which made it very unstable, but by developing um, these surfaces, which 
join um, at the weakest points, um, we began to resolve them. Um, we used the fingers first to stabilize these themes, um, but then the fingers later evolved also to um, accommodate for the resin weaving, as Leo was explaining. This is a sequence of how that process uh, takes place. So we start with flat packed pieces, which um, using the, 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 the knot loops, we're able to start to curve them in shape and um, continue to assemble the node, which gets then the um, fiber, um, the resin and fiberglass uh, weaving to attach the surfaces together. Um, this then is connected to further nodes and then the hyperbolic paraboloid is woven using the fingers um, that was used also to assemble the node itself. This is a, um, an interior of a unit at a 1 to 20 scale um, where you can see the, the pattern of the hyperbolic paraboloids. This is a catalog of the planning envelope in both in two scales. These are some of the, develop the evolution of the end effectors where we started from a very um, simple end effector of just guiding a thread to actually containing a resin chamber for weaving. Um, here you can see some of those um, hyperbolic paraboloids that are expressed in the interior spaces. And further on you see the, um, the whole system coming together, the nodes variating in thicknesses in the white model and um, including the, the window weaving and the timber weaving in the further, yeah. Great work, but we'll come to that later. I just want to you to say something more about the subscription model. I'm not sure if it's clear to everybody. So that you have the five sides and potentially other sides and you don't have an allocated place or you do? Is it like I'm a kind of club member of Soho House, New York, London, and I can go and book these places? Or am I actually, uh, so I'm distributed with my life across five sides? Is that the way it works? Uh well, the way we're intending it is that the subscription living is distributed across different sites and potentially even different cities. So the subscriber doesn't have to belong to a specific place. It has to belong to the place that is convenient at that time. So it is intended to be a sort of distributed living. Um, I really want to take up, following on from Patrick, uh, it seems to me, you know, you produced an immensely elaborate kind of formal uh, kind of hypothesis, uh, and in many ways it's, it, I think, extremely kind of impressive. I want to take up the issue, you know, that starts off by subscription model. Can I just kind of preface it by saying um, I think you need to think about our relation to property in the sense of our relation to things. Um, for most of us, you know, our relation to things and architecture are mediated by a number of different fantasies about what it means to, like, have a relation to it. Now, unfortunately, in a sense, that relation has always been either shadowed or actually directly translated into a legal category of ownership, I mean, of property relations. And it seems to me what's so interesting is that you're really proposing a kind of step in which our relations to objects, uh, that is the, the way in which we appropriate them, in which we need certain, uh, we need a relation, we need a certain consistency in the relation, other people could sort of suggest how you elaborate that. We need a way of kind of owning everything without ownership then being translated immediately into legal terms. I mean, if I could just elaborate that a little bit, that's why there's been such a failure 
of the idea of public space. I mean, the 19th century idea was that once the state on your behalf took something into state ownership, it would completely transform your experience of it. You know, you would be there and you'd say, I partly own this. Well, that's not how it felt like, and it's not how it was, actually. Properties always have to be kind of, in some sense, controlled and organized. Uh, the other side of that is capitalism, in a way, was not even able to fully develop itself. Because, you know, if you're in England, people's relation to their houses is frankly pre-capitalist. Uh, you know, the, 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 there's always been a struggle with the would-be house owner, you know, as to where the hell this kind of enduring feudal fantasy itself comes from. So it, it needs to be kind of supported. You can't do it definitively. Because the problem with all these sorts of projects is they could be used, in a sense, in a trivial way the way people have a not terribly significant relation to a hotel. You know, okay, I know what the rules are, we subscribe, it's quite suitable, it's not that expensive, you know. But actually, if, if the project's to have a real significance, it seems to me you've got to be able to suggest ways in which it can be in the service of like a reorganization of the experience of appropriation of objects in a kind of psychical sense, which doesn't follow like the law. I think you might look at various properties which have a subscription basis. The very obvious one in London is the wonderful London Library, which is a subscription library. People who belong to it absolutely love it. It makes it incredibly possible in a library, to have a personal sense of like appropriation of the library, of the shelves of the books, without ever getting into some legal question, I don't feel in any sense limited in my experience of the library by someone reminding me that I don't own the books. Yeah, I think that's, you know, a really important part of it. Sorry to jump in, that's a very stimulating conversation, but, um, I think we need to look at property as obviously a network of contracts or a social relation. I don't think we can go beyond the legal system someone was always involved because, because uh, this will be a series of rights and duties, mostly rights I would acquire to various places, to various privileges, preferences. Uh, and of course, there's, what is beautiful about this is that there's a complexity, there's a kind of, it's also at the same time, because it's a community, a group, a club, and there is the property notion is of course not just the object of your own. It's always has um, constraints, covenances, um, uh, rights of way, and this will be here also. Like if you look go into a co-op, there are restrictions about who else you could not sell your uh, a property to. It's a collective decision who is coming in. There's a co-opting relation. So there's a lot of things to define, and I don't think we, what is beautiful about this. I believe we live in a world where uh, new technologies. Are, challenge us and the legal system as it stands and contract law and parliaments, they have no way to, they're in the way. And we have to have the freedom of contracting, of crafting, it's an entrepreneurial task. And you becoming an entrepreneur of how to craft a new kind of bundle of rights tied in with objects and relationships between people, objects and people to people and the system of rights. I think that needs total freedom of contracting and we, I think we should try to craft that. In the end, this will have some kind of legal form because we need a contract you sign. And we have this whole discourse opening up also with whole communities, cities, private cities, startup cities. Um, uh, the space of, uh, I think it's very exciting. And um, I think the, the, the um, um, uh, yeah, I just want to say that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, actually, I also want to, to congratulate for, for this uh, uh, amazing quantity and quality of the, of the works and, and the models. So things have been said on, on the social and political uh, level. I would like to um, insist in my comments on the uh, spatial and uh, uh, tectonic uh, qualities 
uh, of what you have uh, achieved. I, I really believe that uh, it's extremely elegant. It's a very light uh, uh, project. It's really well thought. I mean, this model is, is, is brilliant in a sense because it seems extremely simple. It's not impressive at all, but you instantly just want to live actually in this uh, in this space even if if the floor is is uh, uh, completely flat the ceiling is flat so at some point you didn't you you didn't make use of uh, uh, highly complex and, and radical uh, morphologies but still you uh, uh, manage to to achieve something which is uh, really significant uh, I very much like the, the, the lightness, uh, ultimately, of what you, uh, what you have done. Now, the, the question is that uh, I really wonder if uh, this kind of uh, collective uh, housing model uh, is the only one which is uh, well suited for your project. Uh, I would be really curious to, uh, to go a bit more into uh, uh, individualistic uh, <laughs> models uh, of uh, uh, housing. Um, I mean, I believe that it could uh, very, very easily become a, a home, a small uh, home. Um, I also believe that uh, by addressing this uh, issue, you would also be forced to address maybe some other issues like uh, logistics, transportation, the way those things are really assembled, uh, on-site or off-site, etc. It's, I. I know it's part of the brief to have these uh, um, uh, uh, buildings in the city, which uh, uh, actually are completely relevant. I mean, it's, uh, this is a really beautiful building. I would love to, to see this uh, built in London, actually. Um, but I really believe that there's also a lot more potential in your uh, project towards alternative use and, and uh, alternative uh, typologies. Yeah, I think my comment would go in a similar direction. Um, I, uh, I also totally agree, it's a, it's a very nice project, very well done. And I think you've been fairly radical, like in almost all of the aspects of the project, except maybe the site selection and how you use it. And I think on the one hand, that's interesting because it adds this super pragmatic aspect to the project that makes it look fairly feasible. But I think on the other hand, what you get is, is also a fairly conventional sort of building in terms of its size and, and use. And I think it would be very interesting for me as well to speculate about the limits of, of that kind of social system, as it were, right? So what's the smallest possible size? I mean, I think there must be one, because otherwise you won't get enough variety in order to start combinatory logics, right? And that probably is also like a maximum in a way that might well exceed the size of the uh, size you were looking at, in a way. And um, I think that's especially interesting um, because if you look at, at the inhabitants of, of your project as a sort of social system in a way, and, and we just had this conversation, Saji and me, like a few minutes ago, there's also certain dynamics, right, that emerge within that social system as these guys start changing their places and move from one place to the other, you know, and there are all kinds of really interesting social models like the uh, segregation model of shelling, you know, of how people, when they start moving back and forth, suddenly they find themselves in the same place with like-minded people, even if they don't really want it to do that somehow, and like over several cycles of removal. And I think that would be a really interesting aspect to, to look into in the, in the next step, right? How that thing as a dynamic social system could evolve in itself and what might be the size limits to that. Uh, I'd just like to say, based on what I'm hearing here today, and I think this is on the back of yesterday's discussion as well, I think we're living in uh, post-disruptive times. Disruption is now, uh, I would call, a very everyday type of discussion where if you, we live in time of Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, we live in a time where everything from finance to technology to the way we live, the way we inhabit, the way we consume is being disrupted. So these models exist. Architecture is one of the last bastions. Cities are transforming and architecture is now accommodating this future. So I think there's two discussions here. One is that if you look at the uh, primitive and the way you're developing the structure and the possibility, I think you need to build a universe, a much larger universe around your project than just think about structure and thinking about how we inhabit uh, in conventional ways. Because I still believe that if you want to build this universe, then you have to have a larger dialogue. 
you have to think about how your primitive, how your forms can be designing a whole way the way we inhabit this future, which means the, uh, the inhabitation of our lives, the way we consume. I mean, cons uh, subscription exists, exists in airlines, exists in hotels, you know, flyby points, everything is sh shifting. So the way we change forms, the way we change the way we occupy cities has to be transforming a much larger universe of thinking about, you know, do we design the kitchens, the furniture, uh, everything inside. You have to build a story around your project to make this a believable way of transfer, not just knowledge, but as Patrick was saying before, is how you de-democratize de the way we inhabit uh, our lives. I mean, as Francois Roche was on a jury recently when he, you know, he said, you know, we have to think about how we sexualize. Uh, uh, we have to, uh, the family, you know, you have to uh, be more erotic. Uh, so, uh, so uh, in many ways I remember that because I'm not seeing the erotic, uh, the possibility of the family dysfunctional, you know, kill the father, the mother, uh, you know, the <laughs> so, uh, but I'm just remembering, remembering the words. So, so we have to take risks. So, you know, when you describe the way we live, there has to be a kind of a risk taking to push the boundaries because this disruption has to enter our architecture more. So I don't think I want to live in a tent structure. I think you're being very safe. So to do this, you have to enter and speculate further to think about how this life could actually possibly evolve. Yeah. Um. Again, lovely body of work, and I saw it last year, and I was fascinated by the structure, so now I've seen the application. Um, there's a lot that's coming out here, which um, you know, I'm not going to be negative at all. This is all kind of positive thinking. But you know, I sit here, and the first thing I, I look at, I, I look at the existing architecture. You've made me think about existing architecture uh, in these images. Uh, what they're juxtaposed with. And I'm thinking about the idea of what means ownership. Because even if you owned one of these apartments, do you really own, not your project, but the existing ones, do you really own that? You know, if you're in a block of apartments, do you really own those walls? I don't think you do. So I'm fascinated by what you've raised in terms of questioning what, what exists now in terms of ownership. So you've got that. Uh, the secondary thing is that um, I'm not sure if I can relate fully to the application of the structure because you've got, you've got a really great story going on on the one side uh, and then on the other side you've got a, a sort of physical thing which is going on, uh, which, which is an ar architectural study. So um, I think about things like acoustics because there's a lot of transparency in what you've got going on. Uh, and the second thing is, which is very obvious, but uh, you know, we can't keep putting that furniture in this kind of architecture. I mean, we can't. Somebody's got to stop this, uh, you know, or whatever. But, you know, no, but the fact of the matter is, is that you've got such a beautiful approach to um, the con your construction method, which, again, I saw last year. I thought it was very beautiful. Um, and you, you know, you reference Eames and the whole thing, which is kind of a long time ago now, and you've brought it forward. And it seems really kind of disappointing that I'm looking at these ordinary objects uh, in an extraordinary space. So sorry that sounds so obvious, but that's the, yeah, the pink, the pink was good. So yeah, I think you need to give, because you've got it all there to translate what you've got into those spaces. Also. As you said, it's, a, it's got a floor plane and it's got a ceiling plane, which we all need. <laughs> Otherwise, it, it can't exist. But this, where's your approach to three-dimensionality? You're dealing with technology. You, you know, this is a neural network. Your, your structure is a neural ne network of trans transferring information through the whole structure. And then where are your holograms? Where are your holograms of things you love or people you love? You know, where's your living museum of, of, of experiences that you can use these surfaces to, you know, to project on or be part of? Uh, you know, you talk about technology on the one hand, and then you lost it. I, I think to have a fully immersive warmth, if you like, of the world coming to you is an incredible thing. So it's a, it's a, it's a lovely project. It's a very, uh, it's a very stimulating uh, 
thing for me, anyway. So, thank you. Um, I'm kind of wondering uh, about the extent to which the idea can exist in the absence of the project. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, you know, um, we own a house or we rent a house. Those are the most, the two prevailing forms of, um, of, of living still in the world. And now, through the digital revolution, essentially another relationship becomes possible by which what you own, by which the delineation of, because even in a rental apartment, you know, this is mine, beyond that, it's yours. Uh, that's why, for instance, most housing projects, uh, for instance, the Plan Libre never took off in housing because you can build housing with shear walls because the primary structure is what insulates best. It's the best delineation between what is mine and what is yours. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering, uh, there's two things I'm wondering. I think to what extent could this, it's, it's an urbanistic question, to what extent could the subscription model put an end to the completely counterproductive real estate speculation that is actually plaguing uh, cities uh, in the world. And the other thing is, is, is a kind of a, a rather more straightforward question, because in a way you could say that if what is mine and what is yours in legal terms is less defined, to what extent do you need walls? And of course you do need walls, but you need walls for different reasons than legal reasons. You need a wall because even, you know, in the most open, non-possession, ideal world, you need a certain type of exclosure for a certain type of uh, activities. Erotique, uh, for instance, is, is, you know, something which I guess most of us uh, would still like to exercise in the condition of relative privacy. Um, <laughs> but be that as it may, so what I think is interesting is that in looking at the, at, at the physical result of your project, you have essentially these kind of ca tensile cave-like spaces, which I think is an interesting combination that you have a cave-like experience, which you normally have in rocks and in the most heavy conditions you do with, with the lightest material. So it's, 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 that I think is interesting. But then looking at the sections, you have very thin, very horizontal floors and, 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 and anything Beyond, and the floors exist to multiply the ground level in as you need density, blah, 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 blah. But, but almost anything beyond that is driven by a kind of romantic scenery, which is a direct response to our spatial needs and not our economic needs. And I simply wonder, <laughs> once you shift that paradigm, once, let's say, let's suppose that you could eliminate economic requirements from architecture altogether, that would be a real form of liberty, and, and, and one on ones, our desires, will be translated into space. And that's where the whole thing is, is extremely interesting, and you could probably go yet much further in, in theorizing that. I also want to con uh, uh, comment on the tectonics, the materiality, uh, the new kind of sublime offering and I think there's sublimity and otherness and otherworldliness and yet it's rooted within something very very uh, technically evolved and I think like Ross hinted I'm also I think it, the dream hasn't ful been fulfilled in some of these renderings I'm trying to help them think through why is that the case and uh, it starts for me with the skeleton the beauty of the individual object is the rigor of its geometry its, its proportionality and and the order of the component. And I think in the skeletons that is here, there is more uh, order and regularity. And I think the, the, the asymmetry and the, and the disturbance of this would, would have to be motivated and in the end also be systematic. What I feel somehow in, your, in these modules already, there is an, uh, some kind of noisiness in there. I don't know why these uh, columns leaning, why the and getting this stuff on the floor slab is not lining up with the, with, the, uh, with the grid lines. There seems to be some kind of strange, so there's an aesthetic sensibility coming in which isn't in harmony, which, which should actually grow out of the system and not be imposed where you feel you want to, put, it looks too, mod, too rigorous, too modular, too, too. I think the, the complexity will come through an, 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 an ordered, variegated complexity. So that's why this, I think, it doesn't have that uplifting 
beauty and then I think you can bloat it up with warmth and and I think to take pragmatic conditions uh, serious uh, is also an element that say maybe the slab is too thin I mean and you haven't done it here um, um, so that would be just a, a criticism I mean Ross is also totally correct with the, with the furniture he should have used some of his stuff it's totally <laughs> congenial totally congenial <laughs> But I think it's important because because there's and then we talked about consumption and bringing it into the into the into the mainstream, uh, and that doesn't mean making it ordinary, making it absolutely compelling, also an aesthetic proposition. Because I believe in aesthetic sensibilities as being guiding us towards something which is in the end trustworthy and beautiful and and life enhancing, and that's why the beauty of this, which we see here, is not come through. And I gave you some hint why, what the what the mistakes were. Yeah, um, to follow up uh, Patrick's notes, um, I agree that the project beauty um, um, rests in the in the micro scale. We're looking at the material, looking at the the, the order of putting things together, which also um, quite coherent with uh, the fourth distrib distribution to define the space. It's very beautiful. I keep looking at this model <laughs> in front of me. Um, and I find there are two great potential of the project. One, there's actually a hidden architecture, or hidden space series in the, in the system, which is not being actually explored, which is a poche. The space has somehow inside this uh, surface volume, um, but because the way you approach in the architectural scale, you uh, um, predefine those modular boxes which actually follow the conventional logic of a construction, the way that being structured, the way it's being calculated, the way defined by wall and slabs. But in your case, you don't have that distinction anymore. So you actually have a very different, radically different system, which deserve a very different organizational logic, even the way they occupy the land. So we, we talk about the ownership of you know, individual, but, but we also talk about the ownership of the building of the land as well. And therefore, even the site choice could be different. For instance, it might be a uh, uh, navigation between two or three uh, anchor point of the site where taking advantage of your system to grow in the air because structure will support it. And that also bring the, the question of you know, the, sh the ownership or sharing between the building and the city. And the, the way you look at the, the pink box, you, you, you <laughs> primarily think there's a distinction between the inside of the building, the interior, the interior of the building, versus the exterior of the building, which is the city. But in your case, you could challenge that distinction just by looking at the two sequence of space defined or deferred by the structural surface. And then you can play around the scale as well. Uh, I can see it's, it's extremely, you know, uh, stimulating project. And uh, I, I can't stop to think, you know, that direction. I think that we are looking at a project that has so many different layers of experience uh, that would, I guess what I'm, when you discuss, discuss the different layers of your project, the subscription model, and then I guess you got the generative aspects of the architecture. The one that really interests me here is, is how students and architects are starting to think about the systems architecture, about how systems can evolve both from a tectonic, from a formal, but also engage with this experiential. And this experiential is now, if you think about companies like Cisco investing 100 million UK pounds or British pounds into the marketplace, that are not just looking at, at the ephemeral anymore, but looking at how we can generate new typologies, new ways of understanding how Apple's moving out of, uh, into out of this space, how Amazon is suddenly becoming a player in different, totally different directions. So if you think about how cities are going to evolve, this is, for me, a possible Amazon project, because you're looking at systems that engage with the fabric of the city, engage with new funding models, new possibilities. So when you think about subscription, what am I subscribing to? I'm also subscribing to a system, a network that enables me to subscribe to uh, information, a feedback loop, which you talk about with these agents, which suddenly give you the ability to transform, as, as, we, as Ross was saying before, 
you know, to maybe 3D print your furniture in the basement or have things that are available to you in real time, on demand. So you're both not experimenting in lifestyle, you're also experimenting the way you produce, the way you engage with the fabric of new materiality, new fabrication techniques. So what you're discussing here could possibly be part of this ecology of development. And that's what's really interesting, is to think about how these systems can feed back loop into your project to disrupt the current economy of making, but also produce a new way of innovation. I mean, I think it's a fantastic uh, open space to think of new forms of entrepreneurship in the, in the built environment, connecting up with global systems. I mean, the collective is doing this with a totally new product, uh, the curated uh, community. And I think, I just want to hint this, uh, there's Pierre Levy, I've been thinking about this, talking about the so-called fourth anthropological space. Mm -hmm. I'll be carrying the third one will be a professional uh, a demarcation of an identity. The, th the second one was our identity through our dress, through our locale, through our, where we live. And the first one is our name, recognizing our uh, family lineage. So clan first is the oldest one. We still carry that with it, then an address, a location. <laughs> then a kind of professional delineation, and now it's a kind of networks. We, uh, we, we connected in which kind of networks we participate in, we, could, we, we are part of, uh, and various multiple intersecting networks, communities, and that's what you're buying into here, and you connect it up with a second anthropological space in an interesting way, or you totally undermine that, and we're really now becoming networks creatures where we don't need that address anymore, that home, or is it some kind of strange hybridizing between? Yeah, you, you kind of group uh, with, uh, where with we, where we Where people. we locate, a lot of people have now London, New York, uh, Beijing, let's say, or something. And that's the model. That's why I'm thinking of Soho House on the one hand, or also thinking at, at, at the collective going out from London to New York and elsewhere. I wonder how, how you, uh, I think it's really, really compelling. I would be somebody who would like to buy into this kind of condition and, and, and get kind of, uh, rid of uh, my home to some extent, uh, and and I think what for me in terms of what locked me at home was in fact um, my library, but as this now rapidly transfers onto Kindle, I, I don't need a house, <laughs> but I need I need the network and I need the places, <laughs> and I think that's uh, but it's it's the fourth anthropological space. You should look it up, Pierre Levy. He's been talking about this 20 years ago. I think there can be other attractions too. I mean, I, as Patrick's talking, I'm thinking about the individual always, not in, not in a kind of a dark sense, but I think everything is becoming about the individual, the, 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 the portability, everything is in the standing man or the standing woman. You know, you've, you've got your communication devices, you're uh, responsible for your own health and well-being. But, you know, being part of this group, one thing that we're overlooking, you know, with the physicality of your project is it's, it seems to be about filtration. That's how I see it, you know, filtration of information, filtration of relationships, uh, but also, you know, atmospheric filtration. I mean, when, again, when I look at these images of London, we, you know, we all live here, but gosh, it's depressing as hell, isn't it? And, you know, it's like, how the hell do we lighten that up and make sure that we want to subscribe to something which has embedded health benefits in it too? So, you know, you take what you've got you know, I, it's not really my job to do this, but you know, I would. You, everything could be scaled. You, know. you could be developing Dyson-like filtration units. You can put it into the the bones of the building. There's so much that could come out of your approach that's not just a, an architectural idea. I think it's very, very scalable, and I would really encourage you to uh, to look at that. Thanks.